Welcome to the Show Me Podcast with your host, Jeff Livingston. Every episode, a guest joins Jeff and discusses how images tell stories and what makes them work or not. All right. Well, I think we're back for episode nine, which is with uh, a good uh, friend and local or now local photographer, Jareb Ortiz, who also happens to be the large format photographer for various projects, which he's about to tell you about at the National Park Service. Hey, Jareb. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, very Great excited. to be here. So, so, cause I know I was going to mangle your title. Let's just start with that. What is your title? A uh, large format staff photographer for the heritage documentation programs at the National Park Service. More famously known as HABS, okay. Historic American Building Survey. HABS. Yeah, HABS. HABS. Very cool. And I remember when your position got posted locally because there was like the chatter on the DC uh, photography scene, like the new Ansel Adams. Yeah. Are you the new Ansel Adams? Uh, that's for other people to determine, <laughs> not me. I'm just here to do a job. <laughs> All right. Right away, he starts on the right foot. There we go. Well, uh, as you know, we always like to start with somebody's favorite influence. And I love it because I learn a lot about photography that way and what really motivates other people. And you suggested we talk about Edward Bertinsky. And his uh, uh, manufactured landscapes, which kind of became very well known about 15 years ago. Mm. Uh, he did a big documentary and then uh, won a TED Award. And uh, this landscape, we'll start with the yellow one with these uh, folks. I guess it's uh, somewhere in Asia, perhaps China, with these yellow kind of tenement buildings and uh, manufacturing facility. And these people all in yellow just in the street. I mean, what? What a shot. That's crazy. It's like something out of a Pink Floyd album yeah, cover it, or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, what else can you say? I mean, this basically is showing us the scale and the cost of what it takes to produce things, to live the life that we live every day. Right. Because all of this is dealing with the minerals being used at the manufacturing point and all these the products that are being produced here are all being sent back to the United States. Right. So this this whole plant exists solely, which it doesn't exist anymore, but at the time it, it existed solely to produce goods for the United States. Wow. And Wait. this is the workforce that they are were employing at that particular moment in China mm. just for this one particular plant. There's These are all over. It's it's crazy when you look at the scale, and, and that was really his point with this whole manufactured landscape series, um, was to kind of highlight or document the impact that we're making on the world, on the environment, through our consumption. Yeah, and it, the way that I understand it from all the speeches that I've heard him give and reading about his work, because once I found this, I was all in. I wanted to learn as much about what he was photographing, what the intent was. And it started with just minerals in general. He was curious with um, where the minerals come from, the process of extraction, and then following through their lifespan, how these different minerals and resources are used all the way through to their, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for, where they are expelled or gotten rid of to that finishing point. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um T tell me, like, how, how has this impacted your art in your mind? Um, so the way that it's impacted me personally is that when I'm looking at photographs, I, I you, the, the, the way that he's doing photographs here is you initially see it and you think to yourself, Oh my goodness, this is beautiful. Right. This is an amazing photograph. Look it's, at the colors, look at the the composition, look at the shapes. This is great. But then after a while, it starts sinking in and you're like, this, this is horrible. Is, <laughs> this is something that we've created. Right. Like, And when I say we, it's everyone because everyone has some stake in this. I mean, you can say anything you want about being an environmentalist or anything, but at the end of the day, we rely on this these kinds of processes to live the lives that we currently live every day. So with this, these photos do represent us as a, a race, a human race. 
Right. That's the side of us that we don't want to see, right? That horrific impact. And I, one of the things I really found amazing, and I, I, as we were talking before the show, I kind of got caught. I was a little bit late for the show. Um, watching that TEDx video that he did kind of explaining manufacturing landscapes. And uh, it, it's really astounding the scale, like the ability for him to consistently over and over nail the, just the incredible impact on large swaths of land. It's just shocking. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really what it is, is just the overall scale of everything we're looking at here. And, um, I don't know, after, after I, I was exposed to this kind of, to his work, I, um, it really made me start thinking about the way that I approach photography in abandoned buildings and everything. Mm. And in those places, cause I wanted people to look at the photos and say, Oh, that's beautiful. It's, it's great. Like, but then as you look at it further, you realize like, wait, this is a historic place, right? It's beautiful. We can see that it's beautiful, but here it isn't complete and total disrepair. How did we get from these, the remnants of this beauty? Cause at one point this, this was a beautiful place to now something that nobody even wants to bother with anymore. Right. But it's a process. It doesn't start out at that point. It starts out as like, oh, that's a beautiful photograph. And then it takes a little bit more of the intellectual thinking about the context of that photograph. It'd be interesting to see how he fares on, a, uh, or how he would fare with this original work on Instagram, only because I kind of think of Instagram as this vapid medium, right? Yeah. Where people are like, oh, look, that's a unicorn. It's so pretty. I love it. Like, next, right? And yeah. I, I wonder if he would have the same impact in today's social media world. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, I mean, I follow him on Instagram, and I'll say, like, not that active in terms of the amount of people are going there. More than most, but not as much as I would expect right. for the quality of work that he's producing and the message that he's trying to get out there. Um I mean, and I kind of feel like that's the same with me too. But then again, I'm not the best Instagram person in the world. I will post a photo once every three months. <laughs> 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 well, I'm more about like, let's get one quality photo out there as opposed to 50 decent photos. Right, right, right. Totally get that. And um, uh, by the way, what's your Instagram handle for folks that want to follow you? Just at Jarob Ortiz. There you go. Nice and easy. And that's J-A-R-O-B Ortiz. That's correct. Correct. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the strip mine, which is probably something that more people are, are more are familiar with because they've seen strip mines in grade school and all that. But again, another very dramatic, dark kind of a photo, which I think really uh, I chose this because I felt like it encapsulated his uh, his vision really more than anything else. It really kind of shows it, and it's kind of in a traditional medium format cut. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on this? I mean, you see a lot of stuff like this, I bet. Well, I don't really see too much of this process so much. Um, but I mean, my take on this is just look at the composition, look at the colors. Look, th this is what draws me to this photograph is like, here you have these repeating patterns going through and it's really aesthetically pleasing to look at. You see these nice gentle swooping lines going around the whole entire photograph the colors really work well together. You got these jet, these warm tones in the foreground, right. which work really well against the cool tones in the background. So your eye is really stimulated here. And then you start to look at it and realize, oh my goodness, that is an entire mountain range that we have carved down into to extract minerals. And look at where the tops of those mountains are in comparison to the bottom where the water is sitting. Wow. And that is the part where it's like, and this is just one. This is happening all over the place. And it's, that's when you start thinking about the magnitude of it because <laughs> you know this isn't just one place. You don't get to this kind of perfection in the extraction uh, game without having practiced many times. Yeah. So... <laughs> scary yeah it's very scary so um when i let, let's talk a little bit about some of your work and uh i want to talk about ellis island first and the reason why was when i when i saw your photos from there I, it was shocking to me in the sense that i mean relatively there's no like litter and everything but at the same time i got that abandoned urbex feel to it 
Yeah. Um, and this one is the manufacturing wheel, I guess it is. So what that is there is that's the, um, in the uh, hospital administration building, that is actually the gear that ran the elevator. Really? That went from the bottom floor all the way up to the third floor. So it was like basically the main artery for the whole entire building, and that's what ran it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that actually that whole photograph was in completely pitch black dark, and I had to like produce all that light through flashes, metering, meticulous metering, uh, measuring light down to a tenth of a stop because I just don't have time to... Well, I don't have time to make any errors. If I don't get it, I really don't have a chance to go back and do it again and then produce. So it's everything's got to be really... you got to nail it. Yeah, it's it's got to be real tight. That's interesting. So how long did that setup take you? Roughly like 15, 20 minutes? No, like 45 minutes to an hour. So you invested. Yeah, it, it, you have to because you got to figure out what your base exposure is going to be and then what each flash is. You got to ratio all the lights, get all the modifiers on the lights so that you're getting everything you need to show all the detail that's relevant for this particular photograph. We don't want... It's okay the background's black a little bit. You don't see much detail. There's still detail back there. Right. I made sure of that, but... You can see it's a roof, though. I mean, exactly, what more do you need, right? Exactly. Um, and we've gotten photos in other places that depict the materials being used in that roof, so it's not really that important. What's important is we can see all the text on the two gears, see the size of it, how what the surrounding context is. You can see there's a cage around... Yeah. And all that. So is this for preservation purposes, just to make sure that we knew what was there and documented it forever? That's exactly right. It is so that at any given point throughout history, because these photos are housed at the Library of Congress completely wow. um, for, uh, copyright free. Anyone can get them and use them to their heart's content. Very cool. So, um, yeah. It's basically they can extract as much information from the photographs as possible. Interesting. Now, uh, this next photo is actually more of a corridor. Uh, actually, kind of reminds me of Alcatraz a little bit. It's got that same kind of era vibe and yeah. look to it, and all the uh, the chipping paint and concrete and plaster. Uh, is this really what Ellis Island, the state of it is? What, what do people see versus what you get to see? So that's exactly right. This is this area over here is what we call Island 3. So Ellis Island was originally three separate areas. And it's been added on to as a year. So originally it was just one island, then it was Island 1 and 2, and then they added more Island 3. And, um, I mean, this whole area on the south side, Island 3, is mostly closed off to the public. They do small tours where people have limited access with the tour guide. You're not really allowed to go away from them. But this is where I'm spending most of my time doing photography is on that side of the island. So right. it's And I have access that the public do, does not have access to. So if to. you ever need a photo assistant, I'm your guy, Jarb. <laughs> well, just <laughs> come on up to New York and we can uh, make it work. Oh, I'm such a lemming. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's interesting to see that. So this is stuff that the public just generally wouldn't see. However, it's available to them in the Library of Congress or other places. That's exactly okay. right. That's pretty cool. How does it feel to have access to these kinds of places? It's kind of cool, huh? It's awesome because I like to just kind of, when I first get to Ellis Island, is just go into the space and just kind of walk around not even get my equipment out or anything and just let it happen see watch the light for maybe an hour just to see how the light is interacting with spaces at that time of year and then after i have that time i'd start devising the plan of like okay this is how we're going to do this, this is how we're going to move through this space methodically and get the most out of every image very cool very cool. And then I want to pull up another one that you did again for work, um, which is the the lighthouse, which I love. This is like something I would take. You know, like when I see this photo, I, I just think it's great. I love the the pier in the foreground, which is um, it, it, it's not that not uh, what's the right way to put it. It's not dominating the photo. It's it's very subtle. It, it's kind of like oh yeah, okay, now I know what the scale is. But the beautiful blues that you have in this, the hues, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, 
curious. I mean, is this this is digital? I assume. No, that is that's film. That is film. You can see the film edge around. All oh, right, sorry. That is a uh, that says Fuji film on it. Yeah, yeah, that's transparency <laughs> film. So uh, not Jeff's walk of shame on his own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is one hundred percent film, and it's just uh, this is transparency film, um, which has very limited latitude. So. All of this had to be done very quickly, but meticulously. I mean, metered. this is metered right down to a tenth of a stop. And basically, even then, the development was modified a certain, like, half a stop. So I could just eke a little bit more information out of those white bricks. Um, but the the important thing about this photo is that it didn't, like, I didn't just show up and take this. So when I first got to Cape Lookout, I noticed this photograph instantly but i was like if the light presents itself properly at some point during this trip and it's going to be at sunrise i am running out there and i am taking this photo so i had a camera set up off to the side a four by five ready to go ready to go so that in case this moment came up i could grab it and go right to the spot and that's exactly how it happened i got off the boat because they had to drop us off every morning I saw the light, saw the clouds, ran, grabbed this camera, and just booked it all the way over there and just spent the morning just photographing from that point. It's amazing what happens when we get those shots in our heads. I, I have that all the time where I literally will think of a shot. I, I remember probably one of the best shots I ever took was up at Harper's Ferry. It was a dawn shot, but it was literally in my head for months. I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning drove up there it was a foggy morning and i got this insane photograph it was literally the first shot i took that day sat there took 150 more complete waste. <laughs> yeah. shouldn't even just should have just packed it up and walked right off but it was so beautiful i couldn't help myself it's amazing do you find that happens to you a lot where you will literally have a concept when you're going somewhere you'll know that this is a shot you have to get and it and it just rocks yeah i mean basically pre-visualization i mean anyone who's taken any kind of photography course or been through any uh class with anyone they should be mentioning this particular aspect of photography which is pre-visualization this uh, ability to see a photograph uh under different conditions of a certain subject matter and um, it happens to me all the time. And it happens even like with Ellis Island. That's what's basically going on when I'm walking through and looking in those those spaces and just letting the light interact because I'm pre-visualizing like, okay, well, now if the light was coming from this angle, what if I set the flashes up and did That's this awesome. to interact with this light? It's all just like in all in your head. And it, sometimes it can drive you a little mad because what? you're just <laughs> constantly thinking about this stuff. What happens when it doesn't go the way like like I remember I just went out I think we talked about this uh, at the at the focus on the story festival, but uh, I went out to Hurricane Ridge and when I got out there for sunrise it was horrible because there was not a cloud in the sky it was exactly the opposite of what I thought I was going to get mm -hmm. but you had to, had to work it what do you do when you get into your situation and it's the opposite. Um. So basically, you just have to do the best you can with what you got because, like I said, you don't get to go back right and th this is the reason why sometimes people around the office will hear me say well they can't all be winners yeah i mean it's just the truth of the matter but does that drive you, you crazy it does drive <laughs> me crazy because i don't like taking bad photographs so you try to work with the most with what you got like you're talking about a bare sky on a sunrise well then what do you do you try to find an angle where you can fill the frame with your subject matter but then maybe get a tree that comes in over the top so you're filling the blue sky or something right some kind of subject matter that's interesting or at least eats up some of the empty space 100 percent. all right well let's talk about this project uh that you uh have mentioned a couple of times to me which is the civil rights uh project which is really cool um and it's in Alabama, is that correct? That's correct. It's in Montgomery, Selma, and Birmingham. So let's uh, let's pull up the first shot, which is the Baptist Church. But maybe we could start by talking about what the scope is and what you're really trying to document. So the scope of the entire project was 20 sites in Alabama, all associated with the 1960s civil rights movement. Um, 
a lot of the places are now working with the National Park Service since they developed the National Park Service Civil Rights Trail. Cool. These, uh, their churches, uh, private residencies, um, things like this, uh, they're working in conjunction with the Park Service to get grants to do the renovations that they need for these structures because a lot of them are in pretty rough shape. Right. So as part, and then as part of that, they're also going for world heritage with UNESCO. Cool. So what they did was they pulled Habs in, which I'm the photographer for. They pulled us in and they said, we want the documentation of these buildings so that we have this in our pocket. We know that because it's congressionally mandated that historic buildings, when using federal money to make approvals, they have to document it through HABs. Right. Like they have to do a HABs documentation. You must be very busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they roped us in and I was more than happy to drop everything I was doing because this is a project that basically I dreamed of doing ever since I picked up a camera. Oh, wow. So this was pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Oh, man, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah, well, that's because I flipped the photo. Yeah. Up. I didn't tell folks. <laughs> so we're, we're moving from that Baptist church to this interior of a church with that incredible ceiling with the, I guess, the um, balcony there and uh, the round architecture. Quite beautiful, actually. Yeah, so this is Tabernacle Church, and th this is an amazing church. Um, and this photo kind of happened on accident. Really? Yeah. A happy accident? Right yeah. There? I was looking for the photos inside, and what I'll do when I go into a place is I'll walk around and I'll kind of, like I said before, looking at light, but I'll also walk around and touch materials. Like, okay, what's this? Does door handle feel like what's I don't know it's just something I do okay I can't help it and I reached went to the front door to reach and touch the door handle and I was like oh what's this like made out of and like how does it feel so I reach and touch it and then when I turn around this is the view I see wow. and I was like oh well there's the interior I've been looking for let's do this and it's funny because the people at the church said that they've had so many photos taken inside this church and this photo's never been taken. Wow. So I was, which I find kind of shocking because it seems like it'd be pretty obvious. But, but you've got to be able to see the scope. you got to be able to see, you have to be a wide angle person, I think, to get this. Yeah, which you know? is something that I actually had to train myself over time to be. I wasn't that great with the wide angle at the start. I was more of a 50. Really? Yeah. I'm the exact opposite. People are always like, three steps closer, please. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. That's but it, it, you shot this with probably I would assume like uh, at least a twenty four, if not wider. So th this right here was the 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 whole Alabama project uh, with the Civil Rights Trail was the first project we did completely digital um, for the for Habs. Oh, cool. Um, and with this, we we're shooting the Phase One one hundred megapixel back. And I think I was nice. using the 32 millimeter rodent stock digital lens for that. Yeah. So I think, I don't know what that's the equivalent to. I think it's probably like a, I, have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All I know is that it fits. It's nice. It, it worked. Fit. <laughs> 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 I know that it, it got all the information in there. Plus, this is not that podcast. We will <laughs> not talk gear incessantly on this podcast. Refuse to do it. All right. I like that. And notice that my camera has the brand taped on it. We will not do it. Unless you pay me, yeah. sponsors. I'm <laughs> always willing to talk about your camera. Anyway, um, all jokes aside, this this shot I liked a lot too. This is um, a street corner in Alabama, and what I liked about it in particular was that it broke kind of like this one of these bogus kind of internet photography rules, which is no wires, right? And this is all about kind of like the intersection and the symmetry that's caused by the wires in a way which serve as a leading line to that building in the distance. And I just was really astounded by the quality of the image and how well it worked. And that's, well, this is exactly one of those moments that I was just talking about. You could easily walk up and say exactly that. Like, look at all these wires. I, this is impossible. I don't, you could just go in with that kind of mindset, be totally shut off to the idea. But this is, comes with practice of making the most of what you got and understanding like, okay, well, 
these are here. This is part. This is of, what it looks like, right? Exactly. It's part of the environment. It's contextual. This is what this neighborhood is. How do we make it work for the photograph? Right. No, it makes sense. And uh, did you did you have to find yourself walking around the intersection a few times just to get the right angle? Or, um, actually, with that one, it was pretty much like the. I remember just walking across the street, standing on that corner, and just instantly being like, "This is it." Wow. This is it. This is the photograph because it makes the most sense compositionally. Yes. All right. We're going we're gonna to move on from Alabama and we're going to go to the ocean. Okay. We're going to talk Coast Guard. Okay. All right. Now, I know this is a film shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the boats and all that. Um, tell, me, tell me what's going on with this kind of a dock scene and this uh, marina here. Well, okay. So this was a project we worked on for about a year and this was working with the coast guard to document their two 210 foot class coast guard cutter ships mm. um because they are very old and i think that there are plans to replace this ship so they wanted to document it before they put it out of service mm. um and basically here what it was was more of a contextual shot because this was the first one made from the fleet this and is it's the one in the distance right it's the white one yeah, yeah the the which all the sunlight was hitting it it stands out i hope that people understand that's what this is of. right like because your eye should be drawn right to that brightest spot um but um yeah just uh this was um oh the reliance class and this is the reliance cutters so this is the one ship the first one that was named after the entire class interesting and, and i noticed too with the photography i mean you did a, again a nice job with the foreground but the foreground is actually pretty well layered where you have a couple of uh, i guess the roofs of these uh boats right here and then you also have a raft of some sort with people and it kind of showing you the scale so again very well done you know yeah and that was actually a bit of of luck and it, because I was sitting there, I took a lot of photographs of this particular shot, this composition and everything. And I was struggling because all that dark blue in the center of that photograph, all I could think is if there was just something there, if there was just something there, maybe if I wait just a little bit longer, something will happen. And then out of nowhere, this kayak comes right around the corner and fills that space beautifully. And it just like you said, it gave scale. It, did a lot for the photograph very cool and then um excuse me and then let's see here the william callahan let's pull up that photo if we could and let me see if i got it over there no 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 that's not it there it is beautiful look at that reflection and you did that in black and white yes that's that's on film five by seven film um i mean this is another situation of, because I walked up on this shot with the architect that I was working with on this particular project, and we're walking, and he just keeps going, but I just stopped dead in my tracks, and he's like, what's going on? What are you doing? I'm like, this is the photograph. This is the photograph, and he's like, what are you talking about? I said, look in this, stand back a little bit and look in this puddle, and it just was that. And it's this is one of those situations where it doesn't have to be just strictly documentary. Right. This is the situation. This is art. Exactly, where you can make a more compelling photo as opposed to just lining up and just taking a photo of the ship and being like, I'm done with it. Let's move on with our life. And the other thing I like about the photo, too, before we move on, uh, just because we're running a little bit long, is, uh, is uh, I like the way that you set up the lens. So it's hitting dead center on the, on the nose of the boat, but... It's not the boat, the entirety of the boat is not dead center. And so what ends up happening is you get that kind of sloping fadeaway, which is just, uh, it's just beautiful. The leading line created by the boat's edge. Yeah, and it just, because it's a long angle or wide angle lens, uh, it kind of gives you that sense of how large the ship is, the depth of that ship. Yes. Big, big boat. It's a big boat. And then we got one for the DC people since so many people uh, that listen to the show are from D.C. And that's, uh, <clears throat> correct me if I'm right, that's the zoo, right? That is the National Zoo. That's the reptile house. So what were you doing there? Was this another historic site? Yeah, th this is a very historic site. Um, now, when it comes 
to the specifics on the history, I'm not always the best person to talk no, to. Right. I am good We're with just the like, hey, photograph that building. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I can look at this building and tell you exactly why it's special. I mean, you look at the entranceway, that's incredible for the time that this was made. You can see all the ornamentation around the building. Um, yeah, it's gorgeous. It's it's just fantastic. Um, and I believe they're doing renovations to it, so they called us to do the documentation of it. Oddly enough, if you want to hear a strange full circle story, Guess who is photographing the executive team that's responsible for the architects building the new reptile cage? Really? <laughs> yeah, I'm that's awesome. Them on Wednesday, because they're about great. to put out their press announcements. So they're like, "Hey, can you take a picture?" Of course. <laughs> um, let me see. We have one more, and I just wanted to to wrap up with that one. Or is that it? Um, hold on a second. Uh, let's see. Oh, the bridge. I forgot the bridge. I love bridges, so that's why I chose that. Yes, great shot of a bridge. And I love how the shot ends on the corner right there. Just incredibly well-framed. Obviously a long exposure based on the water. Um, and it's this film again. This is 5 by 7 film. Yeah. Um, and this happened as kind of an accident too. I was here working on the Coast Guard project in Astoria. Really? And... I drove, would drive past this bridge every single day. So one night, I just kind of typed into our collection the Astoria Megler Bridge. What, what do we have on this? The photographer before me, Jet, had photographed this bridge, but he had access to the top of the bridge, and he was photographing the joins. Oh, so wow. he was actually standing on the way top point there, that peak you can see. Oh, wow. And he was photographing, looking like at down. the joins. And then looking back towards Astoria. Wow. But he never took the photograph of the whole entire bridge. Voila. So I thought, well, I'm here. I might as well do it. And it was the same thing. I waited and waited and waited for a day that was good for light and good for its natural surroundings. So clouds. Very cool. And this was the last night and that I was out. there. Yeah. So this is a night shot. It's right as it was getting dark. Yeah, so it's right at dark. How long was the exposure? 30 seconds long? Uh, no, it was minutes. Wow. It was minutes. That's awesome. I, uh, it's in a book somewhere scribbled down. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty incredible. And, and not surprising given where you're working and everything. Uh, and the reason why they hired you is because you are an outstanding photographer. So hey, thank you. We really appreciate you coming by and sharing your wisdom with us. Yeah, no problem. And before we say our final goodbye, I do want to say thank you to Panama, who is our sound engineer and uh, works at Hardcast Media. Thank you, Panama. And uh, Jared, where can people find you again? They can find me at Instagram. J Instagram. Jerob Ortiz at Jerob Ortiz. That's J A R O B O R T I Z. Very cool. And then, uh, is your work on the National Park Service site? So, yes, our website is uh, www.nps.gov backslash HDP. All right. Very cool. Thank you, Jerob. Yes. Thank you very much. Cool. Kick in the bad heavy metal. Thanks for listening to the Show Me Podcast with Jeff Livingston. More shows, sponsorship, and donation information are available at showmepodcast.com.